yet spiritually she lives in a situation totally new, in a zone on the frontier between life and death. Without any fear or death, without any fear of death, which I always feared greatly, she says. She observes as though from up high the mechanisms of social life, the farce over money and honor. All things seem to me like an anthill. Everything I see with my bodily eyes seems to me a dream. Merely to look toward heaven recollects the soul. She is secure in thinking that never does he neglect me, never does God neglect me. Likewise, she is convinced that there are few who have arrived at the experience of so many things. As a result, in the depths of her psychology, there prevails the gesture of amazement expressed with her typical words, to be frightened or amazed, repeated with different nuances 22 times in these chapters. The most determining factor in this amazement is the dynamic of the desires and the attitude of hope. She lives against the clock. I am consoled to hear the clock strike, for at that passing away of the hour of life, it seems to me I am drawing a little closer to the vision of God. The hour of seeing God is now measured by the parameter of death. Hence her classic motto, Lord, either to die or to suffer. Notice she doesn't say either to suffer or to die, but either to die or to suffer, as it was an expression of her longing for death. I don't ask for anything else for myself. Another alternative meaning is to die to see him. Not to die is to work for the good of others, for his glory. I would like some soul to profit a little by all that can be said about me. Since I have been living in this house, St. Joseph, the Lord has been pleased that all my desires converge upon this one desire. And he has given me a kind of sleep in life, or it almost always seems to me that I'm dreaming what I see. The final balance, this is the way in which I now live my life. And my father, she sums up the strong tension between the eschatological to die in order to see God and the ecclesiological to live serving others. It is the classical Pauline dilemma in Philippians. I do not know, Paul says, which I shall choose. At bottom, Teresa is convinced that the end is near. Yet she will have to live 17 more years of life in permanent service. That's how she ends her life. Then we have the way of perfection, another little work. As with the life, the way of perfection was also redacted twice by Teresa. But in this case, we conserve both redactions. The life we just had this last one. And uh, the first auto, the first uh, autograph is conserved in the library of the Escorial and is usually referred to as Way E, the Escorial, Way E. The second autograph is conserved in the Carmel of Valladolid and is referred to as Way V. This second redaction had a wider manuscript diffusion in Teresa's contemporary carmels. She personally collect, corrected several of the copies made. See, because when the king, Philip II, who was a great fan of Teresa, when he died, he, he had requested that all the great classical works be kept in his library of the Escorial, and so they had to collect Teresa's manuscripts 
and bring them to the escorial, and that's why the first the, the redaction of the life is in the escorial museum, and so this first redaction of the way of perfection, but the nuns kept the other one. They didn't tell because they had one, and they'll keep the second one. <laughs> Teresa wrote the first autograph way at St. Joseph's in Avila for the nascent community of 10 or 12 nuns, of whom she was the prioress and the formator. She wrote it around 1566 at the request of those for whom it was written destined, dialoguing with them as daughters, friends, and sisters. The Carmelite nuns had known that their prioress had written the book of her life. They heard about that. For certain learned men had insisted, had urged me so persistently that I put in writing the lessons that I impart in words to them daily. The book was born in this climate of reciprocal confidence, intimacy, and love testified in the prologue. So the nuns kept asking when they heard the Teresa, why don't you write a book like the, like the conferences you give us and, uh, for us? So finally Teresa gave in. The autograph of the way B, about your delayed, it was written at St. Joseph's in Avila, probably at the end of 1566 or the beginning of the following year, without any interval after the former redaction. From time immemorial, it has been conserved in the Carmel of Valladolid. In one of the folios at the beginning, Teresa wrote at a later date the dedicatory words. This book deals with the advice and counsel Teresa of Jesus gives to her religious sisters and daughters. That's hers. She wrote that in the beginning. On another hand, now it wasn't Teresa's, wrote a new title on the reverse side of the folio, Book Called the Way of Perfection. So the Way of Perfection is the title that lasted. But Teresa's title was this book, well, she didn't give it a title, she said, this as it deals with the advice and counsel Teresa Jesus gives to her religious sisters and daughters. And in continuation, Teresa wrote herself, this book is intended for discalced nuns to observe the primitive rule of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. The codex lacks the table of contents. Incorporated into the text are the titles of the chapters, reducing them to 42. All of this was revised by the censors with erasures, underlining, and marginal notes which obliged Teresa to tear out various folios. Among them were the four folios that developed the comparison to the game of chess, because they, they thought that would be scandalous that Teresa would know about the game of chess. <laughs> and uh, so they tore it out. But uh, then it has been reinserted. In. Already, but it was written by Teresa. Already in Teresa's time, the way of perfection had a normal diffusion in the Carmels founded by her. It was the book of formation in the spirit and style of Teresa. She herself frequently took an interest in reviewing these copies done at times quickly because copies were made and then prioresses also would insert things that they wanted to put in. So she, Teresa, had to review them and uh, check to make sure that they were what she said. She herself frequently took an interest in reviewing these copies. She regretted the lapses and errors incurred by the impromptu copyists. And sometimes they'd skip parts, not purposely, but just uh, copying a word down here, up here, and then they continue with the word, the same word down here. So you leave out a large part and the copy by hand like that. For the indispensable approbation of the book, Teresa had to have recourse to her Dominican friend, Father Garcia de Torello, 
who had good knowledge of the preceding book of her life. So Father Garfi accepted, for love of Teresa, the commission of being her censor, the censor of the way of perfection. Padre Garcia went over the first 20 pages without any problem. But when he comes unexpectedly to the passage in which Teresa gives her defense of women, with clear allusions to the Inquisition, since the world's judges are sons of Adam, and all of them men, there is no virtue of women that they do not hold suspect. That she writes in the way of perfection. He frowns and decides to do away with this whole passage as being dangerous. He leaves it unreadable, but without any margin or note to say why, only that from this moment on he remains alert and burdens the book with notes and scribbles, entire pages crossed out with an X. He corrects Teresa when she tries to comment on Psalm 88. This is not the meaning of this psalm. Before the allusion to the index of forbidden books, he seriously warns her. It seems she is reproving the Inquisition for forbidden <coughs> books on prayer, and he raises the dangerous allusion. Probably it is due to the warnings of Padre Garcia that Teresa tore out and redid various pages that spoke of pure love, or likewise cut out four pages that treated of humility and the game of chess. Fortunately, all the other passages crossed out by the censor in the autograph have been recovered by the editors. They figured out what Teresa said. Thus we can read them in their original integrity despite the strength of the smudges that were intended to expurgate what was crossed out. After this work of the censor and the consequent meddling of the theologian in the text of the way of perfection, the question spontaneously arises, didn't Teresa succumb to outside criteria? Didn't she have to renounce her own ideas? To what degree were the ideas in the book are Teresa's original thinking? contaminated by foreign ideas or theses? The answer is in the negative. It is certain that the crossings out and smudges in the text made the author to tone down her expressions and even her thought, yet it doesn't seem that even one of the numerous notes of Padre Garcia in both autographs or of the other censors of the second autograph had any impact or distorted even so much as one of the ideas expressed by Teresa or made her retract. The initial project of the book did not arise from a proposal made by Teresa. It was rather an idea agreed upon between her and the group of young Carmelite nuns, members of the community in St. Joseph's in Avalon. Probably it was one of the topics of conversation in the community recreations. The sisters kept begging her to write, and she gave in. I have decided to obey them. The proposal by the nuns was generic, that I write some things about prayer. Teresa specified more at the beginning of the book, that I might manage to say something about the mode and manner of life proper to this house, something that will be of benefit to them, written first in her first redaction in CE. Obviously, the manner of life lived in St. Joseph was a life of prayer. Teresa excluded the use of strange books, although she is aware that there are those that are very well written for what whoever knows what the author is writing about. She will write whatever she will be thinking as she goes along, Without order, she assures, she prefers to pay attention to a model that keeps her away from theories and approaches what is experienced. I shall say nothing about what I have not experienced myself or seen in others. <coughs>